Hello everyone, welcome to the first ever Miscellaneous Monthly. My name is Tim, and today we're going to be talking about unbuilt architecture, and specifically, we're going to be discussing some of the coolest examples of it, because there's a lot of it. When I'm talking about unbuilt architecture, I'm not talking about a simple two-story house in a cornfield in Iowa that was designed by some multi-billion dollar corporation. I'm not talking about that. I'm instead talking about the unique projects designed by some of the craziest and smartest people in the world. Projects that were absolutely way ahead of their time or were just way too expensive for their time and were totally feasible, or buildings that are just not feasible even with today's technology. So we're gonna be checking out some of those and hopefully you guys comment which one's your favorite in the end. Hopefully in the end you guys can comment which one is your favorite because I personally have my favorite but I'll reveal that at the end. Now, a disclaimer for this video is that I am not going to go in chronological order from oldest to newest. I am just going to go in order from my least favorite to favorite. That is what I'm personally going to do. So, in the beginning, I'm going to talk about the buildings that I don't really care much for. And then, later on, I'm going to talk about the buildings that I really like. The buildings that I think are truly spectacular and that absolutely should have been built, but some lame government, for some reason, decided, nah, we're not going to fund this. Because, as I said earlier, they're a lame government. Why would they fund cool things? Anyway, let's get started with my first example of unbuilt architecture, starting with the Tokyo Tower of Babel. If you're wondering what I'm talking about, I'm talking about this structure right here. Now, it's unbuilt for a few reasons. One, it's estimated that it would cost about three quadrillion Japanese yen to build, which is about 22 trillion US dollars. Which, let me say something, that is almost the entire United States GDP just to build one building. And this building doesn't even look good. It looks like it was multiple buildings stacked on top of each other. Oh, and some the thing I want to tell you about this, this thing is supposed to be 10 kilometers tall, or about 33,000 feet, which would make it about 4,000 feet taller than Mount Everest. Yeah, that's something that's pretty impressive, to be honest. Like, no matter what way you put it, I think that's pretty impressive. And it's also supposed to house about 30 million people, which is comparable to the population of Jakarta, Shanghai, and even Tokyo, even though it's a couple million less than Tokyo and Jakarta. But still, it's kind of comparable, and it's extra impressive considering that this is just one building that's supposed to house that many people. But one of the reasons that I think this building wasn't built was its price tag. Now, the math was done on this structure, and it was estimated that it would cost at least 22 trillion US dollars to build, which is about 3 quadrillion Japanese yen. For reference, that is a little less than double the Japanese national debt, which is currently sitting at about 12 trillion US dollars, or about 1.5 quadrillion Japanese yen. So the Japanese government kind of has two choices either go 22 trillion extra dollars in debt building this giant metal structure that's 33,000 feet tall, or pay off all their national debt and have about 10 trillion extra to do literally whatever they want with. Yeah, if I were them, I would go with the second option because this thing is cool in just how utterly ridiculous it is in its scale and engineering, but I don't think it's worth it for the price tag. Like, I think just building this thing would absolutely destroy Japan's economy. It would probably destroy an entire continent's economy, to be honest. Another thing about this structure that would have made it horribly impractical was the foundation that it would have probably required. Because according to the sketches and math that went behind it, 
This building would weigh approximately 10 billion tons, which, if it were actually built, would make it by a very, very, very vast margin the heaviest structure ever built by humanity, making it mo many, many times heavier than the current heaviest structure on Earth ever built by humans, which is believed to be the Three Gorges Dam in China, which in concrete alone weighs 144 billion pounds. That's not even accounting for the steel. That's just the concrete alone. And yet, this tower would weigh so much more than it. My issue with the Tokyo Tower of Babel is mainly its looks, its cost, and other things like that. I don't hate it, but out of all the architecture in this video, it's my least favorite one, solely because of its looks. I just, I just cannot get over its looks and the way it was designed, but other than that, I think it is a seriously cool building. Like, it's really cool, the fact that it's taller than Mount Everest. I think that is just utterly insane, and you know what? It shows that the architect behind it really did not care about limitations, and that's something I can respect. Now we are on to Structure 2, which is actually multiple different structures that were supposed to be built instead of something else, and it happens to be in New York City. For this section of the video, I was actually going to talk about the Twin Tower replacement after the 9-11 disaster, because let me tell you something. The process that went from this to this is actually surprisingly complicated, believe it or not. Because there were a bunch of different building designs, there was a bunch of debating on whether or not anything should be built at all, and there was just a whole lot of discussion about it. I'll have some videos linked in the description about it, because I personally think it's a little too complicated for me to discuss, because it's a frankly complicated issue that I feel like I might butcher, so I'm not going to discuss it. Instead of discussing all of these conceptual towers, I'm going to be discussing one of them. One of them that I don't particularly like. But yeah, the reason I put this particular section in the beginning of the video, right after the Tokyo Tower of Babel, is because some of the concepts that were that I found were kind of horrible. This one right here is my least favorite of all the concepts. Now, the picture on the right is the picture of the concept, while the picture on the left is the picture of what we ended up getting, the One World Trade Center. Now, this concept right here, uh, I hate it. I actually genuinely hate it. It is probably one of my least favorite designs for a skyscraper I've ever seen, and now that I think about it, it kind of makes the Tokyo Tower of Babel look good, just marginally. And you know what? I'm done talking about this building. I'm just done. It is so bad looking that I just want to skip to the next one. We're going to stay in the same city talking about something more upbeat. We're going to be talking about the hotel designed by Antoni Gaudi, the same guy that designed the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. Now, let me tell you something. I love the Sagrada Familia. It is one of my favorite buildings on this planet for a few reasons, but one of them is just the fact that it is still under construction, and it started construction in 1882 which, believe it or not, makes this one building older than the following. Nintendo, Coca-Cola, Starry Night by Van Gogh, and the Eiffel Tower. This building predates all of them and is still under construction. That should give you an idea of just how insane this building is. And this building is being built with modern technology and it's still taking that long. I think that's genuinely insane. Now, the same guy who designed this building, Antoni Gaudi, decided to design a hotel for New York, and it's often referred to as New York's Sagrada Familia, and it looks like this. This is Hotel Attraction, and it is probably one of my favorite buildings in this entire video. It's not my actual favorite building in this video, that'll be coming up soon, but this building right here, I really like its design. I think it is, it's an, it's, it's like Art Deco, 
mixed with the Sagrada Familia. It's kind of like perfect for New York, but there's an issue I have with it. It only has 11 floors according to the, according to some online sources, it only had 11 floors, which is a little bit weird because this thing was supposed to be like 1100 feet tall. So yeah, that's pretty much my only issue, but, but you know what? I personally don't care, but you know what? I bet even with just 11 floors, this thing would still be absolutely incredible and would be an absolutely extraordinary structure if built. Unfortunately, hotel attraction was ultimately scrapped but, on the bright side, the Sagrada Familia is almost complete. In fact, it's set for completion in 2026, which is only two years from now. So, when it's complete, I think I might be booking a trip to Spain because I, I seriously want to visit this building. Like, I don't think you guys understand just how much I want to visit the Sagrada Familia so much. It is a truly incredible piece of architecture, and, and believe it or not, Pope Benedict the 16th actually consecrated it as a minor basilica at some point, which is pretty cool. And it's also a UNESCO World Heritage Site, which is even cooler. The next building I'm gonna talk about is none other than Crystal Island, which was supposed to be this mixed-use structure that was gonna be built in Moscow, Russia, and it was designed by Norman Foster. The Crystal Island Tower would have basically been this tent-shaped building. At 450 meters, this building would have been among one of the tallest buildings in all of Russia, and one of the tallest buildings in all of Europe as well. The Crystal Island project itself was going to be used as an indoor-outdoor park, which allowed people to do cross-country skiing and ice skating in the winter. The building would have also been a cultural expedition, performance hall, hotel, apartments, retail and office spaces, as well as an international school as well. And there were even going to be wind turbines and solar panels built into the actual structure. But unfortunately, this building was canceled in 2009 because of the global economic crisis that happened between 2007 and 2008. With that out of the way, let's go from the 21st century to the 20th century, and let's talk about Hitler's plans after World War II. If Germany won World War II, Hitler would have made Germania, otherwise known as Berlin, the world capital. And in this world capital, it would have contained some truly monumental structures that would have only been rivaled by some of the most spectacular of ancient civilizations. But the piece de resistance of this city was none other than the Vauxhall, planned to be 350 meters wide, 350 meters long, and 290 meters tall, or 950 feet tall making it almost as tall as the Eiffel Tower, which at the time was one of the tallest structures on Earth. Now, the Volkshall was a very special concept for one reason. It was able to hold about 180,000 people, and when I say was, it was a planned concept. It was never built because Germany lost World War II, but if it were built, it could hold up to, or possibly even over, 180,000 people. And it's estimated that this building was so big, the conceptual building was so big on the inside, that when filled with people, it would have its own microclimate. And get this, it would rain inside the building. I'm not kidding, it would actually rain indoors in this building from the condensation of everyone breathing, which is horrible, but also seriously impressive when you think about just how about what is required to make such an to make such a fairly gross thing possible. And other than that, there isn't really too much about the Volkshall, because it's more of a meeting place. It's more of a giant indoor auditorium, indoor stadium. It's more of a giant indoor stadium than really anything, so there isn't exactly too much crazy things about it. And on to the next structure. The next structure is a little more grand, and it happens to do with the enemy of Nazi Germany. That's right, the Soviet Union. And this structure was conceived in 1937. 
the same year as a structure that will appear later on in the video. And this structure is known as none other than the Palace of the Soviets. Which, let me say this, this is actually a really cool building. I actually really like the design of it. I think it's cool. This postcard of it is awesome. Like, why don't we have postcards of conceptual buildings on it in the United States? If you go to somewhere like Miami or San Francisco, it's like, Greetings from Miami or greetings from San Francisco. And it's always the same buildings that you've seen over and over again, whether it be the Golden Gate Bridge, the Miami skyline, the San Francisco skyline, or some boring trees or boring animals. It's never something cool. It's never something that doesn't exist, like conceptual architecture. We need more of it. We need conceptual architecture on our postcards because that will show the world that we are cool. I'm done with my tangent on being upset that the United States doesn't have conceptual architecture on its postcards, but now I'm actually gonna talk about the Palace of the Soviets, which is really cool. The style of the Palace of the Soviets was an art deco neoclassical hybrid that was to be built on the site of the Cathedral of Christ the Savior, which was actually rebuilt considering the Palace of the Soviets was also never built. The Palace of the Soviets was supposed to basically be the house where the Supreme Soviets would have sessions, which, if you don't know what they are, they're part of the Soviet government, part of Soviet legislature, and that's kind of all I really know about them. But with the purpose of this building out of the way, now we can talk about its physical dimensions. The building itself was supposed to be 416 meters tall, meaning that if it were built in 1937, it would be the tallest building in the world, making it taller than the Empire State Building, basically being an excuse for the Soviets to laugh at the United States like, haha, we have a taller building than you. That's kind of what it would be like. Inside the palace, there will be a massive grand hall that is 130 meters wide and 100 meters high, which is able to hold 20,000 people, unlike the Volkshall being able to hold over 180,000 people. And to my knowledge, there is no microclimate or breath condensation rain inside the Palace of the Soviets. So that's an improvement. And if you've been looking at some of these pictures, you'd notice that there's a statue of a man on top of this building. That man is Vladimir Lenin, and that statue is 100 meters tall, or 330 feet tall. So take Godzilla from his 2014 movie, and basically put that on top of a building. That is basically how big this statue was gonna be. And that statue, keep in mind, was already on top of a really, really big palace. A few more cherries on top of the Soviet Sunday is that this building, if built, would weigh about 1.5 million tons, making it quite possibly one of the heaviest buildings in the world at the time. And according to Wikipedia, this thing apparently would have had 187 elevators. I don't know how, but somehow this thing would have 187 of them. And before I move on to the next building, I'll tell you that, believe it or not, I'll tell you that the Palace of the Soviets was actually started. The construction of it actually started. The construction of the Palace of the Soviets started in 1933 with the foundation because, well, that's where you start a building. And then, unfortunately, and then it's, and then construction kind of halted. Construction kind of halted forever in 1941 as Germany invaded Russia. And, well, that's why it was never completed. Anyway, the next structures are just going to be honorable mentions because there are a lot of unbuilt architecture structures. Those first few, those are the ones that I was really interested in. These are the ones I wasn't entirely interested in, but my five favorite are going to be after this. So I hope you stick around. Exceed 4000. Conceived three years before the Tokyo Tower of Babel, 
I personally think that this is a better looking version of it. And the thing about this, it's not as big, nor does it hold as much people. It only has a capacity of about a million people, and it has about 800 floors, which is nowhere near as many as the Tokyo Tower of Babel. But the thing about this, this is basically supposed to be a metal recreation of Mount Fuji because it's four kilometers tall, which actually makes it slightly taller than Mount Fuji. If built, it's estimated that this thing will cost anywhere between 900 billion and 1.7 trillion dollars to construct. The next building in our honorable mentions is the Palace of Justice, which is this gigantic courthouse designed with a prison underneath it. Kind of as a symbol that justice triumphs over corruption, which I think is a really cool thing. And if this thing were built, I'm fairly certain it would serve as a major courthouse within France. For the actual size and dimensions of this thing, there isn't that much, but let me just say this. Those entrances are insanely wide. You could fit a lot of people inside this thing. And that person, pretty small, but I'm gonna take a guess, it is probably massive inside of there. Because if you look closely, those are people. And that's literally all I have for this structure. The Manhattan Dome is a two mile wide, one mile tall dome that is basically supposed to be over top, that is supposed to be built over top of a large portion of Manhattan, and it was designed by Buckminster Fuller. For the actual dome itself, there isn't that much to talk about, but this is one of the most insane mega projects for one reason. It doesn't cover the entirety of Manhattan, and another thing about this, this dome appears to be entirely transparent. So, what exactly would it even be made out of? For my last honorable mention, I chose something kind of stupid, and it's none other than the Dyson Sphere. This is basically a giant shell that's supposed to orbit around the sun and completely encompass it, or partially encompass it, depending on which design you use. It's estimated that this thing will cost one octillion dollars if built, which makes it orders of magnitude more expensive than the Tokyo Tower of Babel or anything in this video combined. But if this thing were built, our energy needs would pretty much be solved forever because the sun produces more energy than we even know what to use for. So yeah, this thing and it is a, this thing is an absolute monstrosity of an engineering task, but theoretically it is possible to build. And if it is possible to build, I think that's pretty cool. And now it's on to my five favorites. For my top five favorite pieces of unbuilt architecture, we are going to start off with something that is just straight up impossible, even with today's technology. I'm of course talking about INTERNATIONAL SPACE ELEVATOR! I think it's kind of obvious on why this structure was never built. First off, it was first conceived in 1895. I kid you not, out of all the years for it to be conceived, it was conceived back in the 1800s. Luckily, the International Space Elevator is a relatively simple idea because it only has four parts. An anchor, a counterweight, a cable, and a climber. The climber climbs up the cable towards the counterweight, which is in orbit, and that's what keeps the cable taut so that the climber actually works. And the anchor keeps the whole thing secured onto Earth itself. Turns out, the International Space Elevator doesn't actually have a definitive height. It could range anywhere between 35,000 and 100,000 kilometers tall. And let me just say this, the 100,000 kilometer tall option is probably much less feasible, considering the fact that that cable has to resist all the tensile forces from the counterweight. Even more importantly, to work properly, both the Earth and the counterweight are going to have to do one full revolution every 24 hours. 
and because of angular momentum, the counterweight's gonna have to go a lot faster in order to even keep up with Earth's rotation, which I found out is actually about 1,000 miles per hour. But at geostationary orbit, in order to go, in order to do one revolution in 24 hours at geostationary orbit, you have to travel about 3 kilometers per second, or about 6,700 miles per hour, in order to go one revolution in the exact same amount of time. And I mentioned a little earlier that the cable has to resist the tensile forces of the counterweight. Yeah, we don't entirely know if this is even possible because of that. That's one of the biggest challenges, because this thing, in order to be feasible, would have to be made out of either graphene, carbon nanotubes, boron nitrite, or some wonder material that doesn't exist right now. And, unfortunately, every single one of those materials I just listed down, none of them are mass-produced. All of them require very expensive machinery to make, and are kind of complicated, and are also very expensive to mass produce. Now with that out of the way, I'm gonna get to the next building on this video. My fourth favorite building, which is made by none other than my man, Frank Lloyd Wright. And quite possibly his magnum opus, The Illinois which is a mile-tall skyscraper that he designed. The Illinois itself was to have 528 floors, 18.46 million square feet of floor space, and was actually a little taller than a mile. It was supposed to be 5,680 feet tall, or 1,730 meters tall. Now, something cool about this structure, it was also designed to have parking for 15,000 cars, and also storage for 100 helicopters as well. Because, let me say this, this thing was absolutely ridiculous. It would have been almost twice as tall as the Burj Khalifa if it was built, four times as tall as the Empire State Building, and exactly 1,175.17 times taller than the LEGO Eiffel Tower, which is currently the tallest LEGO set ever officially released. Now, one of the reasons for why I think this building was never built was cost and just general feasibility, because this thing would have to resist things like wind load, live load, dead load, and all sorts of other different types of loads that a lot of people don't really think about when it comes to designing something. When designing a building, there is a whole lot of factors that go into consideration when it comes to engineering. That's why the phrase, an architect's dream is an engineer's nightmare, is a thing. Buildings like this are examples of that. For an architect, this building is wonderful, but for an engineer, this building is an absolute monstrosity. In fact, pretty much everything on this video is an absolute monstrosity for engineers. And for cost, I would assume that this building would cost over a billion dollars in 1950s money, back when this thing was designed. And I say that because this thing, unlike every other building ever built by humanity before, this thing was a whole new building that had never been built. This thing was new territory for engineering, construction, and just human determination to just make something. This thing was a whole new territory that no one had ever gone in yet. And we're just barely getting there, even with today's technology. I'm now done with the Illinois, and now we are within the big three. Starting with Cenotaph of Newton, or Cenotaph for Newton, depending on how you call it. The Cenotaph of Newton was designed by a French architect who I'm just gonna use a soundbite of a pronunciation for it because I do not know how to pronounce this guy's name. His name is Etienne Louis Boulay. He actually designed some of the honorable mention buildings, and this one right here is my favorite out of all of his buildings they designed. It was supposed to be a Cenotaph for Isaac Newton because this thing was supposed to be built only about 50 years after Newton's death. 
back when people saw what he did as like truly revolutionary like back when his ideas were considered like like earth changingly revolutionary in fact newton's ideas were considered so revolutionary and so incredible that etn decided that the place he was currently buried at which looks like this was not suitable for newton and was basically a mockery of his legacy so he designed this the Cenotaph of Newton, which I can describe as three stone rings surrounding a giant stone sphere that's about 500 feet in diameter. Not the rings, but the sphere. In fact, this structure right here is actually comparable in size to that giant Las Vegas sphere. That giant Las Vegas sphere with all that screen stuff on it. Yeah, that thing right there is actually more feasible to build than the Cenotaph of Newton for one reason. It's made with aluminum, steel, some electronics, LEDs, and stuff like that. Meanwhile, Newton's Cenotaph is made out of pretty much entirely stone. I'm not sure which stone, but whatever it is, this structure would have been absolutely heavy. The walls, the ceiling, every part of this would be heavy with stone. In fact, at night, this thing was actually designed to have lights coming through the ceiling, which appeared as stars. Now, why do I bring this up? I bring this up because those were in the ceiling, which might have been a potential cause for structural integrity issues for one reason. The Cenotaph of Newton was also designed to have a giant chandelier inside of it to resemble the orbits of the planets around the sun. And this chandelier right here is already gigantic. It's much larger than my house. And I'm gonna take a guess that it probably, if built, would weigh hundreds of tons. Those right there are my reasons of why this building would be impossible back then, because, fun fact, at parties, Napoleon would have a plate made of aluminum, while all of his guests would have plates made of gold, because back then, aluminum was one of the rarest, most difficult to get materials back then, so this chandelier was most likely to be made of iron, not aluminum. So it would definitely be incredibly heavy and would definitely cause some structural issues if this thing were built. Because all that weight hanging from the ceiling cannot be good for this thing's structural integrity. And with that out of the way, let's go from the 1700s to the 1900s, specifically to 1937 in France, with none other than the Lighthouse of the World, but known in French as Fer du Monde. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, and it was designed by a man whose name I also cannot pronounce, so I'm gonna use another voice clip of a pronunciation for it. Eugène Fressinet decided to design the Lighthouse of the World for the 1937 Paris World Fair. Also, this thing has a lot of really interesting things. Yeah, that spiral structure you see? Yeah, you have to drive up that, and that's what makes this thing really cool. The fact that there's no elevator, nope, you just drive up the tower. And if this thing were built, it would have been the tallest building from 1937 all the way up until 2010 with the completion of the Burj Khalifa. If it were built back then, even today, it would be the second tallest building on Earth at 2,300 feet tall or 701 meters. And let me say something, this building was not built for a various amount of reasons, one of which is I'm not sure if the concrete back then was entirely strong enough for, you know, to drive up. I'm not sure if the spiral part would be a really good idea, considering that reinforced concrete did exist, but I'm fairly certain this thing with back then's technology was just straight up not possible due to its sheer size, the sheer amount of weight it had, and also the cost. The building's supposed budget was $2.5 million, which I'm just gonna say was nowhere near enough to build this thing. Absolutely not even close. This thing right here 
you probably couldn't even buy the land that this thing's foundation would take up for $2.5 million today. Especially considering the fact that this thing was supposed to be built in Paris, where the average land price is 255 euros per square meter, let alone build a 2,300 foot tall concrete skyscraper lighthouse hybrid. If this thing were built, I would estimate that the actual budget would be closer to over a hundred million dollars. Because concrete may be cheap, but considering this thing's size, this thing would need lots of concrete and lots of steel. You can't just make it out of solid concrete, because it would crumble. You need reinforced concrete for something like this. But its infeasibility for cost is not the reason why I put it at my second place favorite piece of unbuilt architecture. I put it here because I genuinely love, and I mean love, this structure. This structure is absolutely incredible. Like, this thing just looks like it came straight out of a Dr. Seuss book, and I just can't get over that. This thing should have been built. For all we know, if this thing were built, World War II might have never happened. More about the building itself. As you probably heard, it's called Lighthouse of the World, meaning it would function as a lighthouse, and if it were built, it would be by a vast margin the tallest lighthouse in the world. Because the current tallest lighthouse in the world is the Jeddah Port Lighthouse, which is only 436 feet wimpy feet tall. Pathetic. That is seriously pathetic in comparison to Lighthouse of the World. And you know what? Lighthouse of the World deserves its name if that is the competition it gets. Some more things about the Lighthouse of the World is that if it were built, it would have the world's highest parking garage at about 16 to 1700 feet above the ground. And it would have the world's highest restaurant at about 1,900 or 2,000 feet above the ground, which is higher than the current highest restaurant in the world, the Mosphere, which is positioned on the 122nd floor of the Burj Khalifa. And let me say this, this restaurant would be able to accommodate 2,000 guests, making it a massive, massive restaurant. Surprisingly, it wouldn't be the largest restaurant in the world, as the current largest restaurant in the world is in Damascus and has capacity for about 6,000 people. And on that note, I don't have anything else to say. I'm gonna head to my number one pick because, well, I just don't have anything else to say. It's a really cool lighthouse. It's a giant tower that's 2,300 feet tall. And if it were built, I think the world would just be a better place. It would be a lot goofier and cartoonish because, as I said earlier, it looks like something out of a Dr. Seuss book. And now, let's go to my number one pick. I have saved the best piece of unbuilt architecture for last. This is a piece of architecture that is in Japan. It was designed in the 2000s, and it's supposed to be 2,004 meters tall. It's going to be 14 times taller than the Great Pyramid of Giza, and if you take the word pyramid, and think hard about unbuilt structures that resemble pyramids, you know what I'm talking about. I'm of course talking about the Shimizu Mega City Pyramid, my number one pick for the best piece of unbuilt architecture. Like, where do I even begin with this thing? First off, it is supposed to be built in the Bay of Tokyo, built atop 36 pylons spread out over an area of 8 square kilometers, so this thing is not going to be small. In fact, each of these concrete pylons are probably going to be the biggest concrete structures we've ever built, but that's beside the point. This thing is utterly incredible. Like, there are just so many cool sketches of the inside of this thing and just how it would function. It's supposed to be a pyramid that is home to a million people, rather than an Egyptian pyramid, which only houses one decomposing corpse. Pyramid itself isn't just one pyramid. Turns out, it's actually 204 smaller pyramids arranged in a way that they can build one giant pyramid, and inside of it, there's supposed to be 24, like, skyscraper structures that have about 80 floors, and those are just some of the inhabitable spaces. And within the 204 pyramids, there are actually going to be 55 smaller 
pyramids, which are also going to serve as residential areas as well. Each of them are actually going to be about the same size as the actual Great Pyramid of Giza. And the pyramid trusses themselves are going to be made out of these giant tube structures that run for about 86 miles and contain walkways, elevators, escalators, high-speed rail, whatever is going to be in there. There's a whole lot of different ideas of what's going to be actually inside of these tunnels, but it's most likely going to be high-speed transport of some way. To reach the nodes, which are these giant spherical joints that connect everything together. These joints are supposed to be terminals that basically have a whole mess of pathways, and I just love them. I love looking at these sketches, just seeing how chaotic the interior is. I don't like chaos, but if it's a drawing, I like it. Especially an architectural or engineering drawing. The building itself will also be able to sustain itself because of solar panels on the outer trusses, which basically means no power plants are going to have to be built other than the actual solar panels. There might be wind turbines on it. For all we know, there might even be a nuclear power plant built inside of the actual structure, but it's most likely just to be wind and solar powered, because this thing follows a type of architecture called arcology, which is literally the combat, which is literally a portmanteau of the word architecture and ecology. With any building in the subcategory of architecture, it's basically designed to blend nature and architecture into each other as one. Basically, make the building environmentally sustainable while also making it cool, hence the architecture part. I also forgot to mention that this building is going to have helicopter pads on it so that people can just fly up here in their helicopters because well, you want multiple ways to get in and out of this thing. Another thing about the structure is that if it were built, it would es it is estimated that this structure would weigh 1.8 billion tons, which would make it the heaviest structure on Earth. Not as heavy as the Tokyo Tower of Babel, which was said to weigh 10 billion if it were built, but this thing is only about a fifth of that. It's a little less than a fifth of that. So, uh, it's not exactly uh, lightweight, is what we would say. And for cost, it's estimated that this building, if it started in 2030, it would have an estimated construction cost of $600 billion. And speaking of its construction starting in 2030, it is estimated that this thing will be complete in the year 2110, if started in 2030, which... I will be extremely old by then, and I hope I am alive just to see this thing in its full glory then. Which, just remember, 2110 is 86 years away, so we still have a pretty long time before that. With all of that said, I am done with this video. I have chosen all of my buildings, and that's... And that will do it for today. Thank you all for watching if you stayed the whole video length. I hope you guys liked the first ever video in my miscellaneous monthly series that I hope to start into something cool. And anyway, that's all. Bye! Hey everyone, I'm sorry the video is late. I'm really sorry about that. But, to make amends and to, well, make it more fair, I decided I'm going to show you one of my pieces of unbuilt architecture. Specifically, it's a drawing I made a couple of years ago, uh, probably back in like 2018 or so, and here it is. Yeah, I wrote Peace on Earth on the building because when I was designing this thing, the 2018 Winter Olympics were happening, and, well, the Olympics are a time of peace, and that's kind of what. And if you want, you could stop and read all this stuff. And, well, that's literally all. Bye.